Hello and welcome to Hashtag No Limits. Hashtag No Limits is about people whose society places limits upon but who have busted through those limits. Ophelia says in Hamlet, we know who we are but not who we will be. And I believe that to be 100% true and that there is no better example of that than the caterpillar turning into the butterfly. For those who don't know, the caterpillar literally dissolves into its cells and then reforms into the butterfly. That probably isn't easy, but it's still not done struggling. It has to struggle in order for its wings to be strong enough to fly once it gets out of the cocoon. None of that can be easy, but neither is busting through the limits that society places upon people. And today I have Claudine Wiga with me, and she is going to talk about what experiences she has had with her son and an app that she has developed and hopefully will continue to grow and thrive in that app. I do have to do a couple of the business things first, so make sure if you're listening or you're watching that you subscribe to the channel or you give it a like, um, you follow my business page, and then you also just let me know um, if you're watching the live stream that you are hashtag live with us or hashtag replay. And if you have any questions, please be sure to post those in the comment section and we will pop them up for Claudine to see them and comment or answer to you. So Claudine, thank you for joining me today. How are you doing? I'm great, Shelly. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you to anyone that's listening to us live uh, or at any other time. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So very mm. glad that we were introduced um, a few months back and that this has finally been able to work out. So as I said in the introduction, tell us about your background. What has gotten you to the point that you are in today? Well, um, I am a mother of three. Um, I have two, uh, two boys, um, now adults and, and a girl. And, um, uh, I, as far as me specifically, I, uh, I'm a pharmacist by trade. I worked in retail and then I, uh, joined the military, worked, um, uh, served as an officer in the military for tw 12 years, um, almost 12 years, I should say. Um, and then uh, migrated into the Veterans Administration where I worked for another 10 years. And I recently retired in 2000, at the end of 2021. So uh, while in the, in, in the service, we were stationed in Guam. Um, and that's when uh, we really truly noticed, uh, my husband and I truly noticed um, uh, a difference um, in the way that my son was approaching, my younger son uh, was approaching certain things. He wasn't playing with toys the way that uh, his siblings did. He liked more electronics. He learned ABCs and his uh, multiplication and addition a little differently. Um, and in school, uh, we could see a little bit of the difference in the way he interacted with his peers and stuff. And so we decided to have him tested. And, um, you know, I have to mention this, give a shout out to this uh, clinical neuro neuropsychologist, uh, uh, Dr. Pam Hoffer of the Hoffer Clinic in Guam, who did the, um, who did the, the, a very, very thorough evaluation on my son. Uh, we visited her uh, weekly for uh, almost three months. Um, wow. and, and she did a lot of testing, um, you know, a lot of motor skill, education testing, behavioral testing and stuff and diagnosed him with Asperger's and then proceeded to come to the school and briefed, uh, uh, the teachers, um, on what she had found and gave guidance on how to approach his education plan. Truly, wow. I, mean, I can never forget that. She was awesome, awesome, awesome. Uh, up till today, the report that she gave, the final report, whenever I present that uh, to any clinician or to any school system, they are really, really blown away. And they like it a lot because it gives a lot of insight on my son that helps them then prepare an IEP, a good IEP for him. You know, yeah. um, and so so he got diagnosed with Asperger's and uh, a few months later, 
uh, we were uh, transferred to um, to Alabama, to Montgomery, Alabama. Um, and so we, again, uh, no, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. It wasn't Montgomery, Alabama. <laughs> From Guam, we went to San Antonio, Texas. Okay. Yeah. And so in San Antonio, uh, my son attended uh, a couple of schools before we found one that truly catered to people with special needs. Um, and that school, I'm going to again mention, uh, River City Christian School. Uh, they were awesome. They were awesome. They had a very low teacher to student ratio. Um, they had clear a clear curriculum. Uh, there's a program there that I'm just going to mention just in case any parent is interested there. They had a program called Powerline. It was, uh, it's, it's for reading and comprehension. And mm -hmm. it allowed the student to, um, to be able to read uh, while following guidance uh, 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 given through a CD uh, through their headphones. And so, of course, with the teacher's oversight. Mm -hmm. And that was a game changer for my son. It helped him so much with his reading and his comprehension and so forth. So, so then from, um, from San Antonio, we were transferred to Montgomery, Alabama. And we were, again, blessed to find a very good school over there called uh, Church Hill Academy, um, and they they had a little saying under the the under the school title under the the name of the school that said a school for students who learn differently. And oh my goodness, it was a very good pro school. Um, they had cl a clear again a low student uh, to teacher ratio, a good curriculum with books that help to facilitate learning. And most importantly, teachers that were not only nurturing, they were nurturing, yet they had high standards and high expectations for their students. You know, they made the students feel like they can achieve high success. Right. And, and, and that was really good. That was really awesome. And so while we were in, um, in Alabama, I, you know, I'm sure this is what many parents with, with kids with disability do. They spend a lot of time doing research and so forth. And through some of that, I discovered um, uh, social, uh, social skill model, uh, modeling videos. Mm -hmm. And so I started to purchase them. Is it okay that I mention the names of those videos? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. So, yeah, of course. Yeah, so the first one we found was Model Me Kids, um, and I believe they still exist, uh, the Model Me, Ki Me Kids, and they, they give, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they show videos of, of behavior, you know, good behavior versus the bad behavior on how to interact with friends, even in the cafeteria or anything like that. Um, you know, so they, 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 and they have a program back then, they had it through, they started from a middle uh, elementary school, then they added the, the the middle school, and I believe they now go through high school. Um, I had uh, found another one called James uh, James Stanfield videos, also um, uh, social skills modeling that go actually beyond high school. And so I started, you know, buying those for my son, and that that helped him tremendously. Uh, he would sit and watch, you know, and say, mom, this is what they do. So, you know, if somebody looks like this, that's really what they mean. I said, it helped, you know, uh, understand social cues and things like that. So, so that was good. He used that for a few years. And um, one day, a few years ago, he came to me with uh, with question, I, I honestly started to rely on those videos each time he asked me some questions. I say, okay, let's look at the video and let's comment and stuff, you know. So he asked me about dating, um, you know, mm. <laughs> and stuff, and boyfriend, girlfriends, and stuff. So I answered up to a point, and then I was stumped somewhere. So I said, <laughs> well, why don't you, <laughs> why don't you take a look at the video? We'll sit and comment, you know. I think there's a video about you know, dating and stuff. And he said, mom, 
I'm really tired of watching those videos. I've been watching them since I was little. I'm getting tired of them. I don't really want to. Um, you know, can we find a way to discuss that? Uh, and uh, can you just give me the answer and so forth? So I was like, okay, well, let me think about it. And so I, here I go online saying, I'm sure there's something else. And and then I say to myself, well, he likes to play uh, video games. You know, he had already been showing signs of um, of 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 guidance and oversight fatigue with all the. <laughs> The, the ABA and the visits at home and all these things, he was starting to get a little bit fatigued with all of that. And, and us hovering over his head when he watched video and giving him guidance. So I said to myself, well, maybe there is something, um, you know, that is like a game-like, something, you know, that could be of interest to him that would allow him to learn while looking like he's playing a game. And so I searched online a few years back and I couldn't find anything that really met uh, the criteria that I was looking for. Um, so that's when it hit me. I said to myself, well, maybe, maybe, maybe I can work on something like that. Maybe I can mm -hmm. work on something that could be just another addition to all the great resources that are already out there because you know, what happens to other kids that are like my son that are really maybe getting tired of sitting and watching video and having their parents maybe sit with them and guide them and answer questions. And maybe there's something that can be do a little bit more independently um, and just ask questions as, as needed. And then, of course, the parent can go back and take a look at the results of what they did. So that's how the idea of RevMe came to mind. And I uh, RevMe... Uh, the way that I came up with that name is Rev is one of the synonyms of Rev is to stimulate. Oh. And so, mm -hmm. so then I said me, so then stimulate me uh, yeah. to bring out your inner abilities, you know. And so that's how that that came about. And, um, you know, mm -hmm. That's just, I, I guess that probably took too long to answer that quick question. <laughs> no, 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 that's perfectly fine. So there's, because you did say so much, and I was trying to mm -hmm. find anything that you referenced, I was trying to find it online, but you were talking so much and it was taking me so long to find one thing that I didn't get a lot of the things up there. So the one thing that I was able to find is the model, uh, model me kids. Yes. They definitely have, um, a website and it is modelmekids.com. Uh -huh. So I was able to find that. Um, I'm, I was just trying to look for the doctor in Guam. What did you say that her name was again? Her name was Pamina Hoffer. I don't Hoffer. know if she's still in Guam. I think she, uh, she had a home on the mainland. I don't know okay. if she moved back to the States, but the name of the clinic was Hoffer Clinic. H O I believe F F E R, the okay. hospital clinic. It was in Guam. That was like twenty years ago or something. Right. So I don't know if it's still there. But her first name was Pamina, and last name Hoffer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just because mm -hmm. you talked about how mm -hmm. thorough it was, I just mm -hmm. thought if I could find you know something online that I could put up, maybe that other people could utilize her. But I would like to talk about mm -hmm. you know. Um, like approximately how old was your son at the time? Because you said you went once a week for several months. Was that right? Yes. Yeah, he was six years old. Okay. And so uh, it was easier for us to go on the weekend. We, w we met her on Saturdays. Okay. Yeah. And so we would meet her on... So we may have missed a couple of Saturdays, but it was from November through January that okay. we met with her. That's that's the time it took for her. And, and I, I mean, I assume that was like 20 years ago. Maybe today the testing process has improved. I'm sure it would be faster today. <laughs> um, honestly, I don't know because I hear a mm -hmm. lot of, of people mm -hmm. are on waiting lists to have oh, that wow. kind of a thorough evaluation. Yeah. And we're talking seven, eight, nine months. Wow, wow. And, and up to over a year for some places. Yeah. Because it is so thorough. Yeah. 
Um, for anyone who has not had that type of evaluation and they've only ever had an evaluation done maybe through their school system, mm -hmm. um, can you talk, can you remember like some of the components? Of yes. Yes. I actually noted that because I, I see, I read your mind. <laughs> <laughs> I say to myself, well, she may want to know what some of the components of that evaluation. So, so she did, a, 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 of course, neuropsychological assessment, academic skills, um, attention and concentration, language, and motor skills, memory, executive function, personality, and mood. Wow. And yes. 20 years ago, 20 that's years ago. phenomenal because I mean, executive functioning skills are really kind of a hot topic now, and they have been for the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. But that's just in the last couple of years. And, and so for her to have been that forward thinking 20 years ago is, is fantastic. And so you've said that even now you will take that report yeah, and people read it and, and just because it gives so wild. much. Yeah. 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 And yeah, absolutely. I think blessed is a, is a good word to use because the fact that not only did you find her in Guam while you were there, mm -hmm. but that the school was willing to let her come in and give them help or training or support. Um, when I, my husband was in, in the military and we were stationed overseas, you know, I, I sometimes think that it's a better system because you are forced in a way to figure out how to work with the children mm -hmm. in your setting at school. Because if you, because it was a, um, the Department of Defense Dependent School that he was in, right? Yes, yes. It was on, on base at Anderson Air Force Base. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they were very, very open-minded um, in, in allowing her to come and talk to her, to them, and so forth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I had that experience as well when mm -hmm. I worked at a Department of Defense Dependent School when we had a mm -hmm. student um, and we couldn't figure out, you know, what to do. They were like, yeah, let's reach out. Mm -hmm. to other people outside of the school system. Yeah. But I feel like here in the States, there isn't quite the openness in a majority of places. What ha, ha, Have you noticed that? I mean, I know you said you had him in Churchill Academy, um, you know, so that was a private academy. But when you, you did eventually move to a public school setting, right? Yeah, he went, when we left, um, uh, uh, Alabama, we went to Massachusetts, um, and he attended a public school setting for about a year, and then they uh, were, they understood that he was not receiving, uh, you know, that the setting was not the best fit for him, and so they transferred him to an out-of-school district. Okay. So that was good. Um, you know, the, the school district you know, they, I just have to say, you know, I, I think that the, I have the feeling that the schools just got, the school systems just got bombarded with, with the need to support these kids for, uh, with special needs. And, and it was difficult to be ready, mm -hmm. especially with, yeah, especially with uh, given the fact that when you're talking about autism, you're not talking about a disease with a list of medications or a list of guidance. No, you can. We all know you can have ten autistic kids and have to develop ten different plans mm -hmm. for them. Right. So, so you, so then you have to say to yourself, you're talking to the school system, you're expecting them to do this. When exactly did the teachers get the education that they needed to work with these students? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. What, you know, what models did they have in front of them to know how to handle these kids? You know, and that's where parents, we come into play. We need to be willing to look at the, the, the teachers, n not like we're expecting so much from them, but like partners. Right. And saying, what can I do? To help you help my child. Yes. And in turn, help the other children, you know. 
Right. And and like and now that comes back to the point that you were talking about the open mindedness of the school. If they if you find a school that is open minded, that is allowing the parents to bring their their thoughts, the, the you know, to share whatever they have from their 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 their, their therapist outside and stuff like that, that's gonna make a big a huge difference. You know, yes. it's gonna make a huge difference. And so so it's you know, I can't just put a school system in a bucket. It really depends on, you know, what, you know, what, what they were facing, you know, how many students with disability, what types of disability, uh, the, 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 the teachers that they have, what trainings did they have, were they ready, were they ready to do that and stuff. So, so the school system he attended in Massachusetts, they did their very best and we are very, um, you know, grateful for them recognizing, hey, this is not the right setting for him. Let's put him in an out of school district and let's see how they, and, and, and I'm sure based on the, the, the communications that we had with them, I'm sure that they took notes with each situation like those of my kids, because when you send a student to an out of school district, that's a lot of, that's very expensive. So it's yes. much better for you to develop the programs in house so I'm sure they took notes and they 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 improved a lot of stuff in order to to better support students. You know, at least that's what we hope. You know, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. you you brought up so many good points in that little bit there of you know the education part of the how have these teachers been trained? Mm-hmm. We really only had a special education law in this country for, well, we're coming up on 50 years now, I guess. Um, I guess we're at like 48 or something. But when you think about the, when the law was put into place, there had not been any training for any teachers at that point. It was boom. Now there's this law and now mm-hmm. you, the schools have to provide for these students. And there was no prior training. So, I mean, I've heard stories of, you know, people that have said, well, yeah, my, my siblings first uh, special education teacher three days prior had been the cafeteria worker. Mm. And, you know, they just had, they just put teachers in these positions. And so Mm -hmm. the world of education moves incredibly slowly. And, And so when we really are just now coming up to the first true generation that has been trained by people who have done it. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, you were having teachers trained by individuals who had ideas, Mm -hmm. good ones or bad ones, had belief systems, good and bad, Mm -hmm. didn't have a ton of research necessarily what worked and what didn't work. And and now you're finally getting the, the first group of students that are coming out as educators you know, 40 some years, 45 years later that really have, oh, well, okay, now we have some solid research. Now we have some solid strategies. And in a way that's exciting, but I I can only imagine for most parents, that's also sad because, you know, this law has been in place all this, all this time. And yet we really haven't been giving our students the education that they really deserved. And so to have the people that you had 20 years ago, yeah, you, you were truly blessed in that you were placed in the right places at the right times with, with, it sounds like really amazing people. Yes. Um, Mm. Yeah. And, and I'm very, very, very happy to, to hear that. And Mm -hmm. something else that we talked about that you were talking about is that collaboration between school districts and parents Mm -hmm. and somewhere along the way that is really deteriorated. Um, You know, that instead of people wanting to help each other, it seems Mm -hmm. like there's, there's a battle. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I think that on both ends, you know, there needs to be some, you know, open-mindedness and, and just, just refocus like, okay, for the school district, for the, the, the teachers, accepting and understanding that the experience that the parent is bringing is very, very valuable. 
-hmm. You know, a, a parent can talk to you about their child all day long, and it can just take one second to grasp a little piece that is going to make a difference in your other students, on all your students' uh, uh, education, if you accept that with open mind. And, and on the parents' end, it's, you know, not thinking you need to go and fight the school. You know, mm -hmm. you know I mean, honestly, to be a teacher, number one, we, we all know about the teacher's pay. Right. You know, so if somebody wants to really be a teacher, they really, that's a great vocation that we should really honor and respect. And so, so if somebody is teaching your child, you know, before, I'm not saying that there are not some bad teachers out there. I'm sure, right. of course there are. But, but the first, our first instant should be to give them the benefit of the doubt and see and do our very best to work with them without acting like we're going to take over and teach them how to teach. Right. You know, so uh, so I think that if if we on both end recognize the value of collaborating with one another, it's going to be awesome, awesome, awesome. You know, I want to mention something. I hope it's OK for me to say uh, to talk about this, but. Um, the University of uh, of Delaware. I, they have a program where, by which they train, um, uh, you know, that I think they have students that are uh, in their special, um, special education programs there. And so I think, uh, you know, I may fumble a little bit here, but I think that part of their training involves having sessions with parents hmm. of special needs individuals that are willing to, you know, participate in certain programs at their schools. And so, so I was invited to, um, to, to talk to a group, to one of the, the this group of uh, professional, of students uh, there, um, you know, it was, of, of course, through Zoom. And I think that that was really, really a very valuable thing in their education because what they did was they got to talk to somebody. It wasn't just me. I was there, uh, the panel, we, there were three of us in the panel, three parents. And they got to talk to parents with who were dealing with, truly dealing with people with special needs and that got to share their experiences with them and then give them their thoughts on how they thought that they could approach things in certain ways and things like that. You know, of course, we're not expecting them to take note and take every advice that we give, but at least they know what some parents are thinking. They know what we have seen. They know what we have experienced. And it's a huge, huge plus in their education. So Absolutely. I'm hoping that that kind of model exists in many of these um, uh, colleges with special education programs, because that will in turn help with this collaboration that we're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Once they get on the field. Yeah. And I tell, as a IEP consultant, I tell my clients often, and, and usually my clients are parents. Mm -hmm. um, I do work with some school districts, but you, the majority of my clients are individual parents. And I tell them, you are the expert in your child. Mm -hmm. Everyone else on the IEP team is also an expert in their subject, in administration, in their grade level, in whatever related service they might be representing. But you know your child. Mm -hmm. And you have been there before all of the other members of the IEP team, and you will be there after those members leave and new ones join. And you have all that information and, the, and trying to get them to really own that. And then when I'm at the meeting itself, trying to make sure that 
everyone at the table feels equal exactly. and that they're all members of the same team mm -hmm. and we're not fighting against each other. No, no. We're there because no. there's a child who needs assistance. Exactly. And we need to figure out as a group, as a team, we're all very intelligent people. How can we give this child the assistance that they need? Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm just, I'm really so appreciative about that you brought up the, the teacher's education and how mm -hmm. much they do or don't know, because I think mm -hmm. that's a, such a, I mean, that's honestly a big part of my book mm -hmm. is, you know, the fact that we tend, you know, most of my teaching career, there just seemed to be this wall between teachers and parents of children who were eligible for special education. Mm -hmm. They were always, I heard too many times, well, they're just making excuses for their child. Oh my. Their child is lazy. <laughs> if their child would just put in the effort, if they would stop doing whatever and focus more on school. And I, I hated that. I mean, it just, it was like, you know, the nails on the chalkboard kind of thing. Oh, it would just, put, just irritate me so badly because I had had, beautiful opportunities to get to know so many of my students' parents. Plus I had friends and family members that had children that had um, eligibility for special education. And so I saw mm -hmm. how much effort was being put into things. I yeah. saw how much anguish some of the parents had because it did have to be a balancing act. I mean, if you have more than one child, you understand that balancing act of, you know, yeah. we've got this one running to do this and that mm -hmm. one there, you know, mm -hmm. but it was a balancing act sometimes not of academics and medical. I mean, academics or sports, it was academics and medical needs mm -hmm. exactly. or academics and, you know, just having our family be a unit mm -hmm. and try to get along with each other. Mm -hmm. And, and so I, you know, it, it's, we still, I mean, I, I still do a lot of trainings on that. I mean, I have a whole course built around my book now because we're still getting students coming out with their education degree who'd have no idea the perspective of the family. Yeah. Yeah. That is, it's a critical piece. It's a critical piece um, to that education. I, I and, and to tell you the truth, and that goes beyond the teachers, actually even to the therapist. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to say this, not because I have had any bad experience. It's actually based on a positive experience. You know, while we were in San Antonio, my son saw uh, a psychologist um, uh, that when we, you know, one day we were, we were meeting with him and he asked, well, so how was your day? And so what did you do? Somehow during the conversation, I happened to share with him something that I was doing, that I had started to do with my son to help him, you know, with his attention deficit, you know, because we were just used to, whenever he came from school, we were just, that was before he attended the other, uh, the River City Christian School. Whenever he came from school, we would just sit home and reteach him all the stuff and do things. And so, so during reading, of course, he would, he would stop and he would tell me about the butterfly. He just saw, I had to say butterfly. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and then he would, he would bring out. So I started to, and I know he, I knew he liked competition. So I said, well, how about we take turn each reading one sentence? Uh, and and if somebody makes a mistake while reading, the other person can catch. And, you know, we're going to see who wins at the end and stuff. So I would read and purposely make mistakes. So he would catch. And that forced him to pay attention. Yes. You know? So when I shared that with the psychologist, he was like, what? He said, wait a minute. He took note. Uh -huh. he, said, he said, I have to share this with other, other parents. He said, is there anything else? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I love that you brought that up because we we are afraid to make mistakes in front of our children sometimes. Mm -hmm. And we 
we want to read to them fluently. We want them to hear how it's supposed to go. But that's a beautiful way of doing exactly what you said. It's it's mm-hmm. helping him. And it's not going to work for everyone. No. But no. it might work mm-hmm. for someone who's listening today because they've never thought of, oh, let my son or my daughter see that I make mistakes. That I made a mistake. I, I and then, and, you know, and help them catch me doing it. And mm-hmm. um, I do that often with kids that I tutor because mm-hmm. they they do as children, they tend to think adults are perfect. Not perfect. <laughs> that they never ever make a mistake. And and we try to exemplify that, but but we also occasionally do need to let them see us make mistakes, planned or unplanned. Mm-hmm. The unplanned ones are better. But if you're in I mean, if you're in a competition where you're, you know, intentionally trying to get them to keep their focus and catch those mistakes, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, then obviously they're going to be planned mistakes, but yeah. I mean, that's, that's just such a beautiful opportunity for him yeah. to, uh, any student to grow. Um, yeah. And, so- and and I have shared that. I actually shared it during the session with the, the students at the university of Delaware and they actually liked it a lot because, because this is a lot of humility of this mm-hmm. PhD, uh, a PhD psychologist, you know, right. To say, hey, why don't he, I went there for him to help me, and he's taking notes on a lot of things that I have done. <laughs> right. Well, again, because you're the expert on your child, and exactly. you knew, and, you know, and 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 that made me have so much more confidence in him, you know, in uh-huh. in the way that he worked with my son and and so forth. So this collaboration is needed everywhere. It, it yes. is. You know, yes. so mm-hmm. absolutely. So this is a show about busting through limits. So what other kinds of limits has your son busted through? I mean, just the fact that he so Asperger's for anyone who may not have heard that term, mm-hmm. um, it's now considered under the umbrella. I don't even actually know if they use the term anymore of Asperger's, mm-hmm. but it's under the umbrella of autism. autism. Yes. Yes. Um, and, and so what kinds of things when when you were told that he had um, Asperger's, was there anything that you were told, oh, so he's probably not going to whatever, but he is doing that right now? Yeah, uh, actually, even graduating from high school, Mm -hmm. you know, and, um, and he did, you know, yes, with accommodations such as taking a little longer to finish his test and things like that, but you know, each time that you challenge him with something, he he's like, "Oh no, I can do this." When he was at Church Hill, um, he wanted to go to summer school because one of his classmates had beat him in math, and he was like, "Oh no, that that can't be," you know, <laughs> I'm the one in math. <laughs> Yeah, so there's that competitive nature for sure. Yeah, because he was very good with concrete math when he was younger. And so so he he he's able he has that confidence in him um to know that he's capable. Um he he's capable of doing things. He graduated from uh from high school. He he um attended um a, a program uh although uh, you know just for a little bit where he was able to stay on campus with other other students without us there. And that was mm-hmm. something that we were told, uh, you know, he will always need us around. He will always need, he's like, mom, I can do it. I can do it. He wanted to feel like he spent time in the dorms, like his siblings and things like that. And he's been able to do that, you know. And right now he's in a um, in a job skills training program, um, he could have started, uh, you know, to do a, a job here and there, but he has done a lot of volunteer work um, in, in many places, the library, Goodwill, and things like that. Uh, and he loves music. He's always taking music. He's, uh, you know, he, he, he can play uh, a little bit of the piano, guitar, he can play, and he sings a little bit. And he, I have been his... Uh, his uh, engineer he puts me there he tells me to film him doing <laughs> oh wow <laughs> he has created uh, music uh, uh beats 
uh, his own songs and stuff. He writes his songs and he creates them and, oh. you know, he sings and does things like that. Um, he's doing a, a um, he's uh, in a development training job development program right now. Um, we would like him to finish a program like that before he goes and finds a job so that it's not just a job for to be to say he has a job it needs right. to be something that is really um you know that that can, he can sustain for a few years because he likes them that or something like that so so he's been able to touch on many things and he loves to to cook you know he um he loves to That's make- awesome. send him my send him to my house <laughs> <laughs> but with us sitting right there, that's something that we've told him it's a no-no. He cannot be in the kitchen by himself. Okay, understood. <laughs> so there and he he likes to bake, uh, you know, he makes things. He said, mom, don't look. You don't have to look, even though you're sitting there. But you don't. I said, okay, that's fine. That's fine. But did you remember to turn this off? Or did you remember that? Or something like that. So, um you know, to, to to answer more concretely your, your question, when it comes to when he was younger, um, he before, this was actually before he got diagnosed, but we could already see a little bit of something. Um, that was before we went to Guam, actually. We were in North Carolina then. Uh, we were stationed there. And um, the teachers were sure that he couldn't, he didn't know anything about what they were doing in class. Mm. They thought that he was, he just wasn't, he didn't belong there, that he wasn't, he wasn't listening. He wasn't. And I explained to them, I said, I think he's bored, you know, because Mm -hmm. of the very simple, easy stuff that they were doing things that he had already learned on his own on the little computer, Einstein computer that we had bought for him and his siblings, all three computers, he had finished, he was using his and his siblings, you know. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's how he learned. And so, so I ended up, we ended up videotaping him saying all his ABCs, singing the songs from school, counting till 300 and stopping each each time uh, uh, after 100 uh, after each 100 and saying bravo bravo so we could clap for him <laughs> <laughs> i had to videotape him and when i took that video to school and showed it to the teacher the teacher ran out of the classroom and went and called the principal oh and said you have to see this you have to see this Awesome. They were just so shocked. And they were like, I'm so sorry. I don't know how to teach. They just said they just did not know how to teach him. Yeah. Wow. You know. Yeah. And and again, this is going back to what we were talking about. That was like probably 20, 23 years ago or something like that. You know, they they did not know they were not prepared, right. and then and then we soon moved to Guam, and that's when we were like, we need to take him to get tested. I started reading more and stuff. I said we need to get him tested. Something is, you know, and and so 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 you know, we were like, he knows this already. He knows that. He knows all these colors. He knows that's why he. So so in Guam, uh, his uh, his teacher um, would would encourage him to finish writing his a a a a a 10 times so that he could then use the computer because he would write one time and say well I wrote one why why do I need to write it 10 times I already know how to write it you know? right. <laughs> and stuff like that you know but the challenge that he had was more in the comprehension mm. as he got to other to higher levels in school and stuff. So mm-hmm. while he was a lot younger, yes, he cut he all these concrete things of counting and math and things like that. But then the attention deficit really, really started to really be noticed as he got older and as we got he got into higher grades that required not just simple math of 
doing addition and subtractions, but that involved a lot of reasoning and a lot. So, so he needed to focus more to do that. So then we start, he started having more challenges and really needing to be in smaller classrooms and things like that. And really, you know, so, and that's, we, that's why I keep saying we were blessed because all that came with the, at the time when we got the chance to find these schools that I'm talking about. And, and, and even when we got to Massachusetts, uh, I actually uh, contacted the, 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 the schools and got some of the information from them to share with his hmm. team in Massachusetts to say, this is how they worked with him. This is what they did and so forth. And um, thankfully they were uh, again, open-minded and, 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 agreed to, to look at that. And they allowed us to really be part of the, um, you know, the, pl- you know, organizing the plan for him and, and the IEP, even when he was in the out of school district, of course, the, um, the team from the, the district would come and, and direct guide all the IEP meetings and so forth and, wow. and stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's you, you really have had um, a lot of Mm -hmm. blessed situations, but Mm -hmm. I also think that a lot of that came from probably your approach when you would go and talk to the teachers, you know, it doesn't sound like you went in there as if you, you were the, I mean, you were the expert on him, but you were not the expert in education. And so you were like, look, I've got this. Yeah. See what you have and how can we blend those together and improve it for our son? Yes. That's what I tried to do. Um, I, uh, you know, I always, and and I say I, my husband and I, we always really try to humble ourselves and 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 just really, really tell them, look, we're here to help. Um, you know, we, you know, we're here. Some of that may come from our background, from where we we grew up. You know, I was Maybe. born and, and raised in Cameroon, West and Central Africa, and back then. Teachers, I mean, you go to school and if your teachers say you didn't do something right, your parents will be like, what? What? You didn't listen to your teacher? You know, you better do this, you know, because they are the ones helping you. They're the ones teaching and, and stuff like that. And so so we, we, we respected uh, the teachers. That's among some of the, the values that I grew up with that have helped to keep me grounded here. Um, you know, from not only from the teachers that taught me, but from my parents, my grandparents, my great grandmother, of <laughs> that I'm, was named after. I have to mention it, or else she'll turn in her grave. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so she'll be like, "What? She forgot me?" <laughs> <laughs> no. So, um, so yeah. So we, we, we. Honestly, this is really from, you know, the honest, honest bit. You know, bottom of our hearts is that you you know you go to school and you drop off your child. This person that you're dropping your child off with is going to help mold and shape this child's life. Yeah, w- whatever he's going to become tomorrow, this person is going to have an impact on it. Mm-hmm. You know, and so what would you like that impact to be? You know, do you want right. it to be positive or do you want your child to grow up remembering this mean teacher? because they were fighting with your parents and stuff like that, you, you know? So, yeah. so, so I try to think of it that way and say, Hey, can we, you know, and, and, and I offer, and I say, look, I know you're the expert. I'm offering this, whatever you think can fit your education style. Great. Whatever can't fine, you know, but I have offered. You know, that's that's fantastic. So we only have about 10 minutes or so left. And I want to make sure to talk more about the app itself. OK, um, okay. so tell I'm, do, I have your website. I can pull it up. Do you want me to pull it up or do you just want to talk about it without the website? Um, you um, you can place the website there, but then I can just briefly talk about it. You know, okay. um, yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, so, but you don't have to go through pages and pages just to show the website, at least that's all. Uh, but basically, um, you know, the, 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 this first version, and I'm hoping this is just the first version of this application um, that has very um, a, a simple 
what I consider more simple activities uh, than what we can actually put out there for people with disability. Uh, when we think about simple things like doing the laundry or money management or, or, or going shopping or, 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 or making your bed or anything like that, you know, those are simple stuff that we take for granted. But for somebody with, with disability, with autism, you know, it's easy to forget a step. It's easy to, to go to the bathroom, take a shower and forget to turn off the lights. And there goes your, your electric bill, you know, right. it's, <laughs> you know, so, so I just thought about, um, you know, uh, based on my very limited personal budget, I started with something thing simple. I was thankful to work with, um, uh, with uh, to find a, an app development uh, a, a company, um, you know that that agreed to kind of work with my budget, and so we would. So so what what it is is that you can you go on an activity and you can practice the steps of performing certain tasks as often as you would like um, uh, until you get proficient. And you practice those steps uh, on the app in like a game-like format. It's not as game-like as I would have liked to be because that would have cost a lot more money. Hopefully, sure. as we grow, we can do that. But at least it, it's meant to keep the attention of the user a little more than just sitting and watching uh, a, a, a videotape. It's because you have to click to go to the next step. And at the end, you get to see what you did right, you know, or, or what else you need to fix or something like that. You know, things like knowing, you know, dressing according to weather, what clothes to pick, you know, uh, what do you do? How do you know that it's cold outside? Hey, you know, if you have a phone, you can look at the temperature. What does that temperature mean? What does 70 degree mean? You know, things like that. So, so that's really what the approach of the app is. And, you know, I'm hoping that, um, you know, somewhere I would find somebody that would be willing to collaborate with me um, so that we can, you know, tackle more uh, complex tasks. And because there is definitely a need um, for this kind of approach out there so that, um, of, people that struggle a lot with attention deficit, if you just put them in front of a video, yes, it works up to a point. After a while, their mind is somewhere else. Whereas if they were actually having to use their fingers to do something, you will be able to know when they're tired, you know, and, and they, they can go back and redo it, do whatever they want on their own uh, without too much, you know, hovering over their heads. Um, and, and things like that. So it's just simply another alternative just to add to the wonderful resources that are out there already. Um, that's all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it mm -hmm. seems like a very, like you said, it's a needed application. Um, mm -hmm. and, and just scrolling through the website as I was doing while you were talking, you know, I, one mm -hmm. of the things that I saw was that um, it's very minimally priced. Um, <laughs> You know, I mean, it's, it looked like there were some free versions, but then there was a paid version. But even the paid version was, I think it said it was $5. Yeah, yeah. I, I And 50% of that um, uh, is being donated to autism research. 50% um, of the $5. And the free version um, is just you, you still get to do everything else that anybody that's paying is doing. Uh, I just wanted to make sure because there is an, uh, a problem in our society with autism and disability not being well understood in many underserved communities. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted this app to just be available to anyone who would like to use it. So if they don't pay, that, that's fine. You know, I, I still pay the monthly fee that I have to pay to maintain the app and so forth. It's not a big deal. Um, the... The, the, the pay of the $5 is just for anybody who would want to contribute so that we can continue to grow, so we can continue to do something. And then again, 
uh, I would like uh, I donate. I would I would want to donate uh, fifty percent of the proceeds to uh, toward autism research. As we know, there's no medication for autism. <laughs> right. You know, so um, so anything that can be done to help, um, I would like to participate as well. Mm-hmm. Well, that's awesome. So I do have a friend that I introduced you to just today, and I'm hoping yes, that, yes. that will turn yes, into something so that the two of you will be able to collaborate um, because he also he already has something out. Okay. Uh, and, and I've used uh, his program with a couple of my students in the past. And mm-hmm. um, so I'm hoping that the two of you can collaborate and um, maybe what you're doing can be added into what he's already doing or or he can you know, just develop yours even more or maybe guide you to somebody who can. Absolutely. So Matt, if you're watching, I'm, I'm putting you on the spot right now. Um, Cause I know I you said you were going to try to watch. So um, mm-hmm. just letting you know that so that, you know, you, his name is out there a little bit, but um, yeah. So Claudine, I really appreciate that, that you um, you're not trying to get rich off of this you are truly just trying to get it into the hands of, of as many people that would need it as possible. And, um, and exactly what you mentioned, you know, the, the underserved communities um, and the, you know, there's, there's a lot of, of um, research, but there's not a lot of, okay, now we have all of this research. Let's follow this up with, programs because those programs are expensive. And so I very much appreciate that, you know, this is something that currently in 2023. So I say that because at some point this will be also the, just the audio version and that might not be in 2023. So I want to clarify that that's when that's going to, you know, that's when we're talking about it is, is May of 2023. Um, And for anybody who is listening at this time, the website is called um, just revme, R-E-V-M-E dot app, A-P-P. So R-E-V-M-E dot A-P-P. Um, and it'll get you the information that you need now, but they can also find it in um, Google Play and the Apple Store, correct? Absolutely. Yes. The app is available on Google Play and Apple Store. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I mean, for $5 for your child who needs some independence, I don't think that's an exorbitant price at all. And then knowing that not only are you getting it, but then that some of that money is going to further research absolutely um, into autism is mm-hmm. absolutely incredible. So Claudine, we do need to start wrapping up. So I just want to offer if there's anything that you want to say that you haven't had opportunity to say, or um, you know, any part of your story that you want to talk about that we haven't talked about. Well, thank you. Thank you for giving me again. I'm so, so grateful for this opportunity to share your platform with you, Shelley. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know. Absolutely. It's been my pleasure to learn your story. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, there's one, there's just one uh, topic that I would like to bring up is it's a topic that affects <clears throat> the, the people, um, uh, special need population, uh, but also our society as a whole, really. It's the it's the fact that we we are we seem to be letting go of the basic uh, the basic communication mode that we were really born with as humans, um, and that honestly has actually helped to build society the way that it is today. It's really just the talking to one another. Mm-hmm. and communicating in that sense. Technology is awesome. If without technology, we would not be having this session that we're having. Exactly. You know, it, 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 the advancement in technology, it's awesome. That we're doing text messages, text messages and uh, social media and stuff like that. But we seem to be letting go of that very basic mode of communication that is so, so needed for every human being in order to feel like you are still part of this society and feel good about yourself. And when we see, um, when we see uh, studies uh, that talk about, um, you know, a lot of loneliness in our, in our society and isolation and stuff like that, 
So I just say, hey, let's remember to talk to one another, to really pick up the phone and talk. Yes, text message can be necessary sometimes, but if you can, pick up the phone and talk. So on my other little project that I have, um, it's it's on a website called Tansy, but we, that's for another conversation maybe. But uh, I have a little slogan that says, uh, talk more, text less. <laughs> Meaning... Mm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, hey, you know, you you never know. Somebody may be down, and and just hearing a voice at the end, other end of the line, or having a face to face chat with another person may be the game changer, and that prevents them from falling off the cliff. So, so let's just remember that as a society. That's all. That's awesome. Yeah, uh, I I'm very much about mental health awareness, and that's mm-hmm. definitely what you're talking about there. So thank you for adding that to our episode today. And thank you again for being here and um, good luck with the RevMe app and continue to just be you and, and, you know, do all the wonderful things that you're doing with your children. And um, thank you for your service. I didn't say that earlier. And um, I, I very much appreciate all of our military. As, as I said earlier, my husband was military and I have many family members who were military. And so I have a great deal of respect for those who give that part of their life, whether it's six weeks or 25 years and any, anything in between. So I appreciate you and that. And, um, everybody else, thank you for joining. Thank you, Fran. Um, I saw that you were joining us and I didn't even put it up here that you were joining us live from Southern Illinois. So um, thank you for being with us today and I will see you all next time. Bye-bye. Thank you, Shelly. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. (laughs) Hey, parents and teachers, are you tired of IEP meetings that feel like a battle? Let's put an end to the tension and create a collaborative, calm, and respectful environment together. Shelly Kino, your go-to IEP consultant, can transform your meetings into positive and productive experiences. With Shelly Kino, your child is her top priority, your voice is heard, and you become confident. Shelly Kino is making the world better for all, one IEP at a time. Visit www.shellykino.com for more information and set up your free 20-minute consultation today. That's shellykino.com, S-H-E-L-L-E-Y-K-E-N-O-W.